So I think we should go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Um, was told that we typically start at 10 after, which just feels like the wrong way to incentivize and reinforce uh, lateness. So um, we'll try to move it up a minute here as a gradual step toward being on time. Um, thank you all for joining us at the uh, this installment of a wonderful distinguished visiting lecture series. Um, it's my uh, privilege to have the opportunity to introduce our distinguished guest uh, this morning, Chuck Nelson. Um, and before I get too far along, I want to make sure that everyone is aware that uh, Dr. Nelson will be giving another talk tomorrow at noon as part of the Child Psychiatry Grand Round series. That'll be in the lecture hall at uh, Parnassa, at the Langley Porter site on Parnassus. So um, the, uh, the task here is really quite easy in as much as Dr. Nelson is someone who doesn't really need an introduction in the field of developmental cognitive neuroscience. Um, however, um, that's my job this morning, so uh, we'll make it brief. Uh, Dr. Nelson got his uh, undergraduate degree at McGill um, and then went to the University of Wisconsin where he picked up two master's degrees um, and then uh, from there um, to the University of Kansas where he got his doctorate uh, all in uh, psychology with an emphasis on uh, developmental uh, psychology. Um, then after a brief stint at Purdue he went to um, the University of Minnesota, uh, where he was on the faculty for some 19 years uh, before recruiting, a, uh, being recruited away to Harvard, where he uh, currently is. Uh, in this journey, uh, he's uh, picked up um, numbers of different professorships um, in Minnesota. I believe he was a, a professor of psychology, radiology, uh, education, neuroscience, psychiatry, and pediatrics. Um, and carried forward um, most or all of those into Harvard uh, where, he, where he holds uh, an endowed chair also in uh, Boston Children's Hospital, the Scott Chair of uh, Pediatric Developmental Medicine. Um, he has been prolific, as, uh, as you can appreciate, with some 350 publications, but I think notably in the mix at least 170 of those have at least one student author. Um, and I think among the things that Dr. Nelson is most known for is a, what a wonderful mentor he is. And that will come through in the talks today and tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and it's a real privilege to introduce Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Brian, for that gracious introduction. So before I start, I should um, add something which came up in uh, my introduction. Uh, some of you have been here long enough to remember Allison Dope, and Allison and I were undergraduates together. Uh, we finished at McGill the same year, and then she went off to Harvard, and uh, we sort of lost sight of one another until the late 90s when I was tasked with chairing a research network on early experience and brain development that the MacArthur Foundation funded, and Allison was a member of that group. And um, for those of you who know Allison, it was I, I, it's very difficult for me to describe how wonderful she was. I only just wish she was here. Um, to hear this talk because the project I'm going to talk about today really had its birth in this research network and she and Sue McConnell who was a good friend of hers and, and, and Eric Knudsen and others played an important role in shaping the, this project. So uh, let me get started. Let me sort of give you an over, overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to sort of provide a conceptual framework for this work. I'm going to uh, dive into a brief history of institutionalization in Romania, and you'll see why as, as I move along. I'm going to talk about why neglect is bad for the brain, and then I'm going to specifically focus on the findings from this project, the Bucharest Early Intervention Project, which is now in its 17th year. But first, I have to give a brief background to brain development and experience-dependent brain development, even though you'll be familiar with, with, with this. So, 
We know that postnatal experience is the engine that drives most of uh, many aspects of postnatal brain development. That some experiences are, or at least should be, universal to all members of the species. So that would include things like sensory input and caregiving. And these basically help ensure survival. But there's another class of uh, environmental features that optimize development. So instead of simply having a caregiver that feeds you, you have a caregiver that's invested in you and is sensitive and responsive to your needs. Or instead of having uh, just uh, light or sound, you have pattern light like faces or sound like voices. And these are really designed to tweak and optimize development. And in both cases, these experiences uh, often have to occur during a narrow window of time, what we call a critical or a sensitive period, for development to proceed along a typical developmental trajectory. And so I borrow this slide from my colleague, Dick Howhenge, to illustrate this, and I think probably many of you have seen this. But the point is that during these peaks is when the brain is particularly receptive to being shifted by or influenced by experience. Notice that there's not a critical period, there are different critical periods, and in fact, Janet Worker has shown that even within language, there are cascading critical periods. So I don't think that there's a single critical period as much as most critical periods run their course in the first few years of life. Another couple of points to make about experience. First, experience cuts both ways. Uh, I actually, uh, for years, attributed this quote to uh, a former mentor of mine, Bill Greeno, but then Bill told me it was actually Jay McVicker Hunt who uh, coined this term. And the idea then is if a child is exposed to adverse experiences during a critical period like infection or maltreatment, or deprived of expectable experiences like nutrition or caregiving, brain development can be undermined. But of course, if they're exposed to good experiences, that might maximize the chances of healthy development. Another point to note is brain plasticity changes with age. Of course, I'm very self-conscious speaking about plasticity in the, at, at UCSF, but uh, I hope I'm not going to misquote anyone. Uh, in some domains, change is possible throughout the lifespan. So the example I often give is learning and memory. And then I talk about my mother, which is only appropriate in a department of psychiatry. So my mother is 91. I had just put my phone on vibrate because it usually she'll have to call me a few times a day because her iPad or her cell phone or her computer or any electronic device isn't working, and it's part of this conspiracy, she thinks, that is uh, uh, going against her. Uh, but she's managed to master these things. But there's other things that we don't get to do better. We don't learn to see better, for example. Um, the ability to change the brain decreases over time. And this is the sobering slide I, I show students who are typically to the left side of this. And this is illustrating, of course, that brain plasticity changes with age, in part because the physiologic effort required to shift the brain increases with age. And you, if some of you are sitting here thinking, am I on the left side or the right side of this? And some of you are wondering how far to the right side of this you are, and some of you are on the, on the cusp of this. Um, the last point to note, and probably the only humorous thing I'll say in, this, in my talk today, is we all recognize that the earlier you acquire things, the better you do them. And so we'll start with this. This is me teaching my two and a half year old son how to play squash. Right? Now, this is 25 years later. I'm going to show this movie. Um, this is me clutching my side. This is him cleaning his glasses. They're very foggy. You'll see why in a minute. This is, the, this is doubles. This is the other dad and the other son. Watch the sons and watch the um, fathers. That dad's here. That's my son. That's the other son. That's my son. I've decided that the role of the father is to be supportive and encouraging and let them get all the balls. And so the fact is, I played squash many more years than he's been alive, but I didn't learn when I was two and a half. And some of you have seen the pictures of Tiger Woods swimming in a golf club. And so the point is that we do some things better if we do them early. So many elements of postnatal brain development here adhere to this principle of critical periods. Most critical periods during, uh, occur during this time of rapid brain development, the first years of life. After a critical period is passed, the effort involved in changing the brain becomes greater. So my talk today, now the question is, what happens to the brain when there's a profound violation of the expectable environment during a critical period? In other words, given what I said, that many aspects of postnatal brain development 
are influenced by experience, what happens when the brain doesn't get those experiences? And so the way to think of this is that there's a set of instructions that are embedded in experience and in the environment, and it has to imprint and then build neural circuitry. So the worst thing you can do for a brain is not to give it those instructions, and that's similar to what happens in neglect. So the second question is, can the deleterious effects of early deprivation be reversed? In, and if so, are there temporal constraints on doing so? So if a child experiences profound deprivation early in life, is there, degree, is there some evidence that they can recover from that deprivation? And does that recovery vary as a function of how old they were when the deprivation ended? So let me talk a little bit about psychosocial deprivation. Neglect is the most common form of child maltreatment uh, in the United States. Um, a particularly extreme form of neglect is being raised in conditions of profound psychosocial deprivation, such as children being raised in institutions. So uh, UNICEF estimates that there's about 140 million orphans around the world, and about 8 million or so live in institutions. And institutional care is a common form of treatment for kids who are, are, have lost their parents or whose parents have abandoned them. And the idea then for us was that can we use the study of profound deprivation as a model system? So as a neuroscientist, we know that if we can either control or manipulate experience or deprive an organism of experiences, then that's a way to understand both critical periods and the role of experience. So this is sort of a natural experiment to see what happens when children experience profound deprivation. So this project, which was an outgrowth of that MacArthur network, uh, had three goals. One is to examine the effects of institutionalization on brain and behavioral development, to determine if these effects can be remediated through an intervention, in this case foster care, improve the welfare of children in Romania by establishing foster care as an alternative to institutional care. And the only reason my picture came up first is I don't know how to animate this slide. I think, right? So, but yeah, it's okay if I come up first. So the point is that these are my two colleagues on this. Charlie Zina, child psychiatrist at Tulane, and Nathan Fox, a developmental uh, scientist at the University of Maryland. So let me give you some background to why we're doing this study in Romania. So this is Nikolai Ceausescu. He uh, who, uh, took over this communist country and himself as a communist in 1966. And they had this idea that he could increase his power if he increased the population. And so he put into play a series of decrees that were designed to boost the population. And so here's how that looked. Um, he established the menstrual police. So these are state gynecologists who went into the workplace and did physical exams of any woman of childbearing age to make sure she wasn't using birth control, hadn't had an abortion, et cetera, et cetera. She established the celibacy tax. So basically families that had fewer than five kids were taxed. And then he outlawed all contraception and abortion. And the result of these policies was that the birth rate skyrocketed. And as a result, he conveniently built institutions throughout the country to warehouse these children, convincing families that the state would do a better job raising these kids than families would. So in a communist system, it was the collective mentality, and as a result, families felt more comfortable turning over kids to the state. So child abandonment became a national disaster. Families couldn't afford to keep their kids. They were encouraged to turn them over. They turned them over. December 1989, this Akuj Ceausescu was tried and executed, which, by the way, is on YouTube, which I find amazing. And um, in January 1990, uh, organizations like Human Rights Watch went into the country to start to see what was going on. And what they found was more than 170,000 kids living in state-run institutions throughout the country. So the answer to why Romania is that it had a particularly egregious history in, a, in an experiment of social engineering of large numbers of institutionalized kids. Poverty was often the number one reason given for child abandonment, but the fact is there were poor people all over the world who don't abandon their kids. So there's a cultural issue here as well. The international media went into the country and basically started reporting. The first piece may have been on, not 60 minutes, 20, 20, 20 um, where they showed these poor young children languishing in state-run institutions. And the result was that many of these kids then started to get adopted into Canada, Great Britain, and the United States. The problem was that uh, these families were not prepared for their children. They, uh, 
with a good heart thought, if they just loved their, these kids enough, they would be fine. And as you'll see today, it's more complicated than that. But what happened was that the families weren't prepared for the big developmental challenges a lot of these kids had. And as a result, it became very difficult to, uh, to tend to these children's needs. So now it's sometime around 1999, and Charlie Cena in our research network uh, is dispatched to Romania to see if it's feasible to do a study there. And this is what he found. So, So we've known for possibly a hundred years that children raised in institutions are at a high risk for a variety of cognitive, social, and behavioral problems. They have disturbances in social relatedness and attachment, externalizing behavior problems and attention and hyperactivity, deficits in IQ and executive functions, a syndrome that mimics autism, and growth stunting. <clears throat> so I want you to think, um, are these boys or girls and how old they are? And Ryan, what's your best guess? Boys or girls? Can you? Um, boy on the left. <laughs> yeah, so this is a 17 year old girl, and that's a 14 year old girl. And so, as a rule, kids lose about a month of linear growth for every month they spend in a highly deprived environment. So, uh, for the better part of a year, this research network um, it helped Charlie and Nathan and me design this study including the experimental design as well as the ethical issues in doing a study like this. So it's the first ever randomized controlled trial of foster care as an intervention for early institutionalization. We screened by a pediatric exam and a pediatric nurse practitioner more than 180 kids that were all babies at the time, well, probably below about a year, to screen out any kid that had an obvious neurological or genetic um, problem. We could not do blood work. All we could do is a physical exam, and uh, if we have time later, I'll explain that a few kids got under the radar that we now are a little concerned about. But at the time, the idea was to screen out kids who had any developmental challenges because we felt this would work against our hypothesis. Let me explain what I mean by that, because when I lecture to medical students, this can be a half an hour discussion on the ethics. The government was convinced that institutionalization is the intervention for abandoned children. We tried to convince them that foster care, or because we gave up on adoption, that foster care would be an alternative. We were worried that if we included kids with special needs and we didn't show a beneficial effect, the government would take that to mean, see, we should just keep the kids in institutions. Now, we're in a position now, we think, of replicating the study in another country where we will include such children, but at the time we did not uh, because we were already anticipating how the, how the government would respond if we had no effects. So after the 180 was screened, we landed on 136 that met our study criteria. We did an extensive baseline assessment on them when they were on average about 20 months of age. And um, then we randomly assigned 68 of them to remain in the institutional group, and 68 were randomly assigned to foster care, and then we had 72 kids who had never been in an institution, lived with their parents, and they became our in-country, never institutionalized group. 
Um, the plan was to do the study for a few years, and then that would be the end of it. So we saw the kids at 9, 18, 30, and 42 months, and then we did, a, I was running out of money, so we did a limited 54 month, yes? Did you standardize the elements of foster care? I'm going to come to that. I'm going to, I'm going to go through the ethics of the study, and then I'm going to describe foster care in about two minutes. Um, and if I don't answer your question, then come back to me. Uh, so we thought 54 months would be it, but then I started finding money, and at eight, we saw them again at eight, and then I said, I'm done going to Romania. But then I found more money, and we saw them again at 12, and then I said, I, I, I'm done going to Romania. I want to go to Paris or London. Um, and then we found more money, and we're just now, we've just finished a 16-year follow-up. And guess what? I just submitted a grant to see these kids again at 20. So this is either, it's either a, a polymorphism for doing longitudinal studies or it's a net addiction and it, it's hard to tease, tease this apart. So um, I'll be presenting some data today through age 16 but most will be through age 12. So here's what the design looks like. The kids come into the institutional group and then half go here, care as usual, institutionalization and foster care and then the never institutional group. The three of us have different backgrounds and the three of us are collectively, um, <coughs> tenacious would be a, a polite word, thick-headed would be another. So when we discuss what should we study, um, we never really can come to an agreement. So this is the list <laughs> of things we study because we always think that what we want, I'm an only child in particular, so I think what I want to study is the most important thing to study, and then they think the same thing. So it now takes four or five sessions to get our kids through this entire battery. On the other hand, it's a study that is unique and will probably never be done again in the same format, so the more information, the better. Okay, so, so let's go through some of the ethical considerations. Why Romania? We were invited in by the Minister of Health who did not believe in institutionalization and thought scientific data would be useful in arguing against his colleagues in the government to move a system towards family care, like foster care or adoption. Um, we, got, we, of course, had permission from the IRBs from the United States and from all the authorities in Bucharest. We could do randomization because all studies to date looking at kids who had come out of institutions have great potential for sample bias who gets to be adopted. So for example, kids with behavior problems are less likely to be adopted than kids who are nice, sweet little, little kids. Uh, in the 60s, red, in, in one study in England, redheads didn't get adopted. I'm sure lefties didn't get adopted. So anyone with a difference didn't, doesn't get adopted. So there was a scientific rationale for an RCT because of, it avoids sample bias. But more importantly, there was a policy debate within the country, which is the country felt for an intervention, the best intervention was institutionalization. Um, if we didn't do the study, all the kids that were in the study would have stayed in the institution. There was no more than minimal risk. We couldn't do a stock rule if you do an RCT, if you start to see your findings are, are uh, leading to effect. So what we did is about a year or so into the study, when we, we peeked at our data and realized the kids in foster care were doing much better than the kids in the institution, we worked with the U.S. ambassador to Romania and we organized a press conference where we announced our findings to the government and to the press. And within a year, the government passed legislation forbidding the institutionalization of any child under two. And they started to deinstitutionalize kids and they started government foster care. Of course, we can't take all the credit. There was pressure from the European Union. Um, we have a policy of non-interference, so we expected that over time, children would change their group assignment. We wouldn't got, get in the way of that. So let's say the people in this part of the room or in the institutional group and that part of the room in the foster care group. If you had the opportunity to be reunited with your biological family or get adopted or get placed in government foster care, we never got in the way of that. The same would go there. So over time, there's been changes in group assignment, but the data I'm going to present, with one exception, all use intent to treat based on the original group assignment, so it's a, a more conservative uh, approach. Um, and we provide data to the government as we went along. But the other reason we could do randomization is that there was no foster care in place when we started, and we had to build our own. So what that meant we had to identify families, I'll come to this in just a minute. We had to identify families, then train them, and monitor them, and pay for all this. And we could only find 58 families that we thought would be good foster care families. So we placed 68 kids in those 58 families because we kept siblings together as another ethical requirement. So we were not withholding treatment. Before I go on, 
to the foster care. Any questions about the ethics? I tried to anticipate your questions, but if there's something I missed, okay. So now, foster care. Um, Charlie Zena has a long history of developing, uh, working in the foster care system and the child protection system in, in New Orleans. So he brought a team over to help design this intervention program. So uh, the families received a stipend, a monthly stipend, equivalent to the average per capita income in Romania at that time. So it's not like the U.S. system where you're paid by the kid. You're given a living wage and we spent a lot of time figuring out what that wage should be and we decided it would be the average income in Romania at that time. Our social workers, we had three social workers, visited the families every 10 days, and every seven days they met with us by Skype or sometimes in person, every few months in person, to sort of troubleshoot the kinds of issues that parents were reporting. They couldn't get their kids in the bath, they couldn't get their kids to eat. And so there was a, another, even though the intervention itself was focused on relationship building, there were these inadvertent interventions where when kids were in trouble or being a challenge to their parents, we got involved and we helped them. Uh, we provided all material support like toys and diapers and things like that. We had a 24-hour on-call pediatrician, kind of like a concierge foster care program. Uh, Romania law required one parent stay at home with the child so that the child wasn't in daycare. And all families were licensed. So this was, by all accounts, very high quality foster care, not garden variety foster care. It would have been unethical to do quote, garden variety foster care because we thought these kids are going to need a big intervention, not a little intervention. So did that answer your question about foster care? Okay. Okay, now I'm going to get into the findings. Um, any questions before I go on? Yeah. Uh, did the families, uh, the families that are genius in terms of um, already having their own children uh, currently or just Yeah. So, on average, the average age of our families were mid-40s, and many of them had already raised kids and had older kids. A small subset still had kids at home. Um, There's something you didn't ask that I was going to answer, but now I forgot my own question. Did you have so, any um, families that had no experience with uh, childhood? No. And I just remember my question. It, it's a sample composition. It's not about, it's not the composition of the foster care families, it's the composition of the sample. 30% um, or so of our institutionalized group were Roma. Uh, gypsies. And I point that out because there's huge racial bias throughout the world against the Roma. And we know a lot about the genetics of the Roma, which have been sort of a distinct band that sort of goes from Ireland through India and then back up through Eastern Europe. And to this day, although we peek at it a little bit, we have never reported Roma versus Romanian effects. And the reason is that First of all, the Roma population is vastly overrepresented among institutionalized kids. They're more likely to give up their kids. And second, any differences we observed would feed right into the racial bias that families have. And hence, we have this conundrum of scientifically, we really do want to know, but from a policy perspective, do we want to keep our head? Until we can explain any differences, it, I think it would be irresponsible to report those differences. But we, we can talk about that later. Um, okay, so again, as I said before, we're going to focus on intent to treat with uh, one exception as I go along. So I'm going to start with IQ and then I'm going to move from IQ to, to behavior to psychopathology and then to brain and biology. So we'll start at baseline before randomization and what you can see is that using the Bailey, the score of the never institutionalized group is exactly the population average of about 100 but the score for the kids in the institution is 64. All right, so this is, on average, at 20 months of age. Kids haven't even spent all that much time in the institution, and they're already at 64. So now what happens with placement into foster care? So we do it this way, 30, 42, and 54 months. In every case, the kids in foster care in blue have higher IQs than the kids in the institutional group. This is not a decline. We went from the Bailey to the Whipsy, so we think this is a test instrument issue, not a decline in IQ. But the important part to notice is, oops, sorry, is that 
kids, this is just foster care, kids placed before two have markedly higher IQs than kids placed after two. So all of these are foster care. And there's actually not a difference here. So we see this inflection point similar to the, well, my discussion of critical periods, that placement before 24 months leads to better outcome than placement after 24 months. Even at age 12, we see that the kids in foster care, still, we still see an intervention effect for full-scale IQ, use this using the WISP. Um, but of course, the other thing you'll note, and we we'll might want to circle back to this, is that although we still see an intervention effect, the kids in foster care don't have IQs that look like the never institutionalized kids. They're simply higher than the, ins the institutionalized kids. I think I said that right. But at age 12, our timing effect went away. We, we see an intervention effect, but we lost the critical period. Now, something that we're often asked is, are, do you see individual differences? And so we did this sort of cluster analysis. This is kids in foster care across the first 12 years of life. And it turns out there are two major profiles of development. There are kids, 23 of them, that have a pretty typical profile. That is, their IQs stay in the normal range all the way through age 12. But then there's another group that has sort of a declining profile, so that over time they actually start showing a, a reduction in IQ. So it's not to say all children responded to the treatment exactly the same way. There's some individual differences. Um, what explains this? Attachment status at 42 months, age of placement, and sorry, and number of disruptions. And um, number of disruptions means because of the government made these decisions, there were kids who changed group assignments institutional care to the biological family, back to the institution, government foster care, back to an institution, things like that. So these are the three things that in part explain those profiles. So it isn't just descriptive that we had this low and a high, but we can explain the protective factors and the risk factors for the low and the high. What about the kids in the institutional group? So there is actually this one group here that actually show an increase over time. Uh, there's only 12 of them. And, but it's not quite clear why. What is it about those kids that seem to be getting better? It could be that there are many fewer kids in an institution and the ratio of caregivers to kids is better, but we actually don't know. But the other groups are declining, and you can see that uh, in blue, this is particularly low. And we do by now have something like a dozen kids with IQs below 50, which is very sobering. So, uh, IQ takes a big hit by being placed in an institution. Removal before the age of two and placement into foster care leads to a, a greater recovery. We don't see washout and overall IQ effects by the time the kids are 12. And we can explain some of the individual differences that not all kids in the institution respond the same and not all kids in foster care respond the same. So attachment. So uh, this was a big issue because in the history of work like this, people have always been concerned that children who come out of institutions or who are neglected generally show severe disturbances in attachment. And that attachment relationships may serve as the uh, foundation for subsequent relationships, peer relationships, which I'll touch on, intimate relationships, and the like. Um, so perturbations in early attachment could derail development. So let me show you, this is uh, one of the things we did when they were little, is the Ainsworth strain situation, where uh, do, should I tell you what this is, or do you know what it is? I never why do that, because only five of you are gonna nod one way or the other, so I don't really know the answer to that question. So, um, caregiver, child, in a room with toys, we see how they you know, interact. Stranger walks in. What does a child do when a stranger walks in? Well, many children will get a little closer to the caregiver. Then, caregiver leaves, leaving the child with the stranger. What does a child do? And then the stranger leaves, leaving the child alone. And then there's a reunion episode when uh, someone walks back in, either the caregiver or the stranger, and you see how the child reacts. So this is 18 months. This child has now been left alone. And uh, let's see what happens. So, in many respects, this is sort of a classic reunion episode, right? 
he jumps right into her arms. He said, this is the first time he's ever met her. And that sort of indiscriminate behavior is what we're concerned about. Are there any attachment experts here? So if an attachment expert, one thing they would notice is that the child jumped into her arms, but she didn't completely envelop them. Those of you who remember picking your kids up at daycare at this age, they kind of strangle you sometimes when, they, when you pick them up. So the child jumped into her arms, but was a little ambivalent about how much to hug. Um, but this indiscriminate behavior is sort of the hallmark feature or signature phenotype of a child who's experienced profound social neglect. So this is baseline before randomization. If you see here, I guess I used break for this, um, more than 70% of the never institutionalized kids are, have a secure attachment compared to 20% of the institutionalized kids. And then conversely, the vast majority of the institutionalized kids have an insecure attachment. If we look at the intervention, just the middle panel, the kids placed in foster care before 22 months, 70% have a secure attachment. The kids placed in foster care after 22 months, 70% have an insecure attachment. So that same inflection that I talked about with IQ, uh, when the kids were 54 months and eight years, I'm only going to talk about 54 months, we did a functional version of an attachment uh, uh, challenge which was trying for our IRB. So we range for the caregiver, we say to the caregiver, a stranger's going to knock on the door, let your child answer the door, and let your child do whatever they want. So the caregiver knocks on the door, and the stranger says, come with me, I have something to show you. And our dependent measure is, does the child walk off with this complete stranger? And here's what we find. For the, in the kid community sample, you know, the never institutional age group, there was one kid who left, which we've been closely monitoring this one. <laughs> in the institutional group, 55% of the kids walked off with the stranger. In foster care, that drops to less than 30%. So that indiscriminate behavior, in a very functional way, persists. Yeah? Did you vary the gender of the stranger? No, it was always a female stranger. And we did that because we were concerned that um, they don't they don't, the kids in the institution don't see males. They're all female caregivers. So we were concerned we'd have a confound and then we kind of get you know, weirded out by a man. Um, so children randomly assigned to the care as usual group have a much, are much more likely to walk off the stranger than the kids in foster care. Now, one has made the argument, some, some have made the argument that early attachment relationships are the building block for peer relationships. And so we started looking at peer relationships at 8, 12, and again at 16. I'm only going to present the eight-year data. and just do this in two slides. First, we just asked teachers to, to rate the social skills of the kids. And what you can see here, the kids in the never institutional group get really good ratings. The kids in foster care before 20 months get good ratings. They're not different. Kids in foster care after 20 months don't differ from the kids in the institutional group. So we see a similar inflection based on teacher ratings. But then we also did real live interactions. And so I want to show you one. Um, so we did these complex uh, dyads where the child, a target child, kid in our study, was uh, put in a room with the kid from the community they didn't know, with toys and a caregiver. And we just we, we, we asked them to play. We did a number of things, but I just want to show you this video. It speaks a lot. So the boy in the white, this is one of our staff psychologists. She's been with us since 1999, and before that she was a psychologist in the institution. So I should say that there were six institutions in the, in the city. We drew from all of them, so we didn't get sample bias about institutions. And we were based at number one in a communist system. They, they gave things numbers. And number one at one point in time had 1,000 children in it. It's like a college campus. And when we started in 99, there were 400 kids in it. And she was a psychologist there and before she joined our team. So this is the boy, uh, he, these are eight-year-olds, who's been in the institution since uh, birth. And this is a kid we, we brought in from the community, and they're, they're playing a game.
it's clear that that boy hasn't a clue how to interact with another kid. And one of the things that you see is that the other kids sort of reflexively try to engage and play, and then after a while, they just back off, and they don't want to play with that kid anymore. Um, and so that was sort of the pattern. So overall, we see a great reduction in the ability of these kids to interact with peers. Psychopathology. I, I knew eventually I'd get to psychopathology. So I just want to point out, this is a, 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 an orphanage, an institution, I can't call it an orphanage, for teen, teenagers, and they all let me take their picture. And uh, in this uh, institution, there's one wing for boys and one wing for girls. And this is the boys. And then this is sort of a classic view of what the, the, some of the wards look like. These are colorfully um, you know, painted and, and, um, and the like by usually NGOs that come in. But many of the rooms are just white walls, white ceilings, white cribs. So let's start with this. This is 54 months. We use the PAPA. Oops, sorry. Helen Geiger, no, anyway, you helped us with this. So if you look at any disorder, you see that 64.5% of the kids in the institutional group met DSM criteria for any disorder. That was 45, 46% for foster care, 22 here. If you look at emotional disorders, so in this case that meant mostly anxiety and depression, 44% of the kids in the institutional group, 22% in foster care. Um, and then no difference in behavior or ADHD. And we'll come back to this, and I'm glad Steve is here to help me interpret why ADHD lives at about 20% and there's no intervention effect. Uh, 12 years. So now we see overall disorders has declined, but still a big intervention effect, right? Emotional disorders have gone. So the issue we saw with anxiety and depression at 54 months isn't there at age 12. But behavioral disorders are big, but we see a big intervention effect except for ADHD. And so I just realized I'm confusing you. We're now, the blue are the ever institutionalized, meaning the, the combination of foster care and institutionalized because we saw no intervention effect. So we just pulled it. So you can see if you look at, if you've ever been in an institution, ADHD is about 19%, 25% have a behavioral disorder. Um, if you look at aggressive behavior symptoms in boys, care as usual versus kids in foster care. So it's a bigger issue in boys and girls, so we see a big intervention effect there. Then what we started to do is this is the first time we broke intent to treat. We thought, given the literature in foster care that kids with multiple placements have less good outcomes, we should take a close look at placement disruptions. And so a kid in the institutional group over time might have been reunited with their biological family, who then reabandoned them, and then placed in government foster care, then reabandoned, re gone back to an institution. So we simply looked at the number of placement disruptions with the expectation that fewer disruptions leads to better outcomes than more disruptions. So the way we did this is, you know, so we have care as usual here, foster care, 28 wound up in the disrupted care group and 26 in the stable group. So if you look here for emotional symptoms, disrupted, these are odds ratios, is much higher than stable. So there's a benefit to having a stable placement. If you look at aggressive behavior symptoms, this is disruptive, this is stable. All right. So we see a very high prevalence of mental health problems in these kids. Stability of placement plays a role in this. Gender does a little bit as well. Um, but we see no sensitive period in psychopathology. In some domains we see recovery, but those domain, the recovery is not influenced by aged placement into foster care. All right, let me now turn to the brain. We assume that the behavioral phenotype that we've been describing has its origins and underlying differences in brain development. So we turn to EEG and NIRS, sorry, EEG and MRI. And so let's start with baseline. So we place sensors on the scalp surface. We can record the brain's electrical activity. Um, we color code it to represent red would be more brain activity than green. And you're looking at this uh, from the top down. So here's the nose, back of the head, left ear, right ear. And what you can see is how much more brain activity there is over the frontal lobe in the never institutional kids compared to the institutional. So this is at baseline. 
If we now jump to age eight, institutional group, foster care after 24 months of age, they're identical. Foster care before 24 months and never institutional group, and they're identical. So again, we see this inflection point at around two, which looks like recovery in the, in the EEG. So that's what I just said there. So then, um, when we first started the project in 1999-2000, I explored doing MRIs. There was a single 0.5 Tesla scanner in the city, which was used clinically. Romania joins the European Union in the mid-2000s, and they discover capitalism. And as a result, all these private clinics started buying up scanners and having these clinical services. So we found a 1.5 Tesla Siemens scanner that was identical to what we were using in the U.S. And with a lot of uh, negotiation, we arranged to scan our kids. Uh, we could only do structural imaging. There's no EPI there. So we, we can do morphometry and we can do DPI, but that's it, no functional imaging. Uh, so you've all seen pictures like this. So I'm going to report the published 8 to 10 year data, um, which was overseen by Margaret Sheridan, a former student of Steve and, and Tom's. And then I'm going to report the 16 year preliminary findings, which just came out over the last month or so. So if we're going to look at gray matter first, if we go here, there's no intervention effect. There's a dramatic reduction in gray matter for the institutional group compared to the, uh, in, in foster care compared to the never institutional group a finding that is perfectly replicated at age 16. So there's a reduction in gray matter, no intervention effect. If you look at white matter, what we see is a modest intervention effect so that there's more white matter in kids in foster care, but not as much as there in the never institutionalized. And we see that carried forward. So what's good about this is we're replicating ourselves from the younger age to the older age. The other check was we know developmentally from data from the US that there's a change in gray matter from eight to 16. And so sure enough, what we see is a decline in gray matter, but you'll notice that the slopes are slightly, this is the never institutional group. These are the foster care and institutional group. So of course they had less gray matter. And white matter, we see the reverse, we see an increase. So at least we're replicating what people here have reported, which is a decline in gray as kids go through puberty and an increase in white. Um, so uh, that's pretty much what I just said. I'm not going to talk about the DTI data. We see uh, differences in, we looked at, I think, 48 fiber tracts or 44. We see differences in some fiber tracts, not others. In the places we see differences, some there's a critical period, some there is not. Um, at age 16, we're, we have a glimpse that the left cingulum, but not the external capsule is showing an intervention effect. And all this is to say that it's not as though the intervention impacted every domain. It selectively impacts some domains and not others, which could be regulated by the critical period, meaning the average age of placement was 20 months. So perhaps we'd see more effects if the kids on average were placed younger. But the other thing is that, um, even within the brain, some domains benefit from the intervention and some do not, which helps explain behavior. Okay, so uh, the last part is, uh, I'm gonna talk about stress and then biology. So um, at some point, I forgot exactly when this was, I had two postdocs in my lab, Margaret Sheridan and Kate McLaughlin. And one day, they, they kind of they hung around as a team and they used to gang up on me a lot. And they walked into my office, they said, you need to look at stress physiology in this sample. And I said, what do you mean? Oh, you know, we should look at heart rate and competence cardiography and cortisol and blood pressure and all those things. And I said, how are we gonna do that? And they said, well, you're gonna build, build a lab there. So I waved my hand <laughs> and I said, okay, fine, go off and write a grant and we'll see what happens. So like over the weekend, they put together uh, a, a small grant that I submitted to NIMH as a supplement to the parent grant, and they funded it. So then they were sent over there and sent up this autonomic lab. <laughs> Those of you who know Kate and Margaret are not surprised at that story. Uh, so what we did uh, to start with is the Trier stress test, uh, which is similar to what I'm going through right now, except I'm not being monitored. <laughs> at least I don't think I'm being monitored. Um, 
So the kids are told they have to deliver a speech about what makes a, a good friend, and they have to do it in front of two teachers they've never met. And there's a preparation phase where they're writing, organizing their speech, then giving the speech where they get negative or neutral feedback from the teachers, very much like giving grand rounds. Uh, and then there's a math test where they have to count backwards uh, by multiples of seven from 100 or something like that. And all the time, we're measuring cortisol and blood pressure and uh, impedance cardiography and heart rate and the like. So let's start with cortisol. You look at the overall group analysis. Here's the, the, when the giving of the speech. Big court response for the kids who'd never been institutionalized, but no difference between foster care and care as usual, unless you break down the foster care be, by placement before 24 months or after. These are the kids placed before, and they show an absolutely normative cortisol response, but the kids placed after do not. And if we just look at heart rate, at 12, we see the biggest heart rate is by the kids who've never been institutionalized. That is to be expected. And then foster care, and then care as usual. So they're, the kids in foster care are showing the expected increase in heart rate, just not as much as the kids in the institution group. But at 16, we seem to have lost that. And that's concerning. Uh, so now we no, no longer have that intervention effect of the heart rate. So the children in the institutional group fail to show an appropriate autonomic and cortisol response to a stressor. The children in foster care at 12 show an intervention effect, um, and at least in cortisol, the intervention effect is influenced by the timing of placement. Uh, at the age 16 effect, the concern is, is this a worsening for these kids who, as they negotiate the challenges of adolescence, find it increasingly difficult to figure out their way in the world. And then finally, um, um, I'm going to talk about telomeres. And part of this was uh, a group of us uh, at Harvard uh, started to meet to discuss using telomere biology. And um, Liz Blackburn came to visit. And that sort of got me very excited about this. So briefly, we all know about, how could you not know about telomeres being here? Um, so here's what we see. Telomeres get shorter with age, so everyone expects a downward slope. This is the institutionalized group over the first 16 years, and this is the never institutionalized group. And so what we're seeing is a, more, a steeper erosion in the kids in the institutional group than the kids in the never institutional group. We can't get health records in Romania, so we, using the health behavior questionnaire that Tom helped develop, we just ask caregivers about the health of their kids. And what we find is that the kids categorized as having fair health compared to good or excellent have the shortest telomeres, which probably is, should not be surprising. So greater telomere erosion among institutionalized kids, at least at age 12, more erosion associated with more parent-reported health issues in the kids. So let me sort of summarize things and then draw this to a close. Not all domains show recovery and not all domains show an effect of institutional rearing. So these are the domains that show an intervention effect, but no sensitive period. Psychiatric outcomes, positive emotional reactivity, peer, peer social competence, IQ, white matter volume. I didn't talk about this, but remember the girl in the early video as there were all the kids were in the room rocking and she smacked one kid in the face? That girl, who's still in an institution, has a preserved IQ in the mid-90s and is very high in callous and emotional traits. And so what Kate, Kate Humphreys reported is that we see a high prevalence of callous and emotional traits which is reduced by placement into foster care, but it's not regulated by, by timing. Much to my surprise, there are three domains which I've studied my entire career that seem to be unaffected by being in an institution. I, I, I've been wrong a lot, but I've never been this wrong. Well, maybe I have. I'm denying that I've been this wrong. We thought that their ability to read faces, to discriminate faces, would be compromised, and it's not. It, early in the study, there were simple discrimination tasks, but as the kids got older, we did much more uh, uh, sophisticated tasks, like trustworthy tasks. Who would you help? Who would you like to be your friend? Things like that. 
there's no differences. There's no effect of being in an institution. So I have a whole way of explaining this now, but it's like how all your best hypotheses come to you after you've seen the data. So I'm a little reluctant to share that. Um, and then these are the domains that show no intervention. We see very high rates of externalizing, many executive functions, and gray matter are uninfected by the inter intervention. These are what the timing looks like, and I'll qualify this in just a minute, by different, by different domains. Our age range was six to 31 months. We have very few kids under 12. So anything I say about critical period should be viewed in light of the statistical distribution of ages. We just don't have enough little, little kids or really older kids to really look at this carefully. But still, this is what comes out in the data. So institutional rearing increases the risk for serious impairments and delays in most domains of development, high quality foster care, uh, reduces but doesn't eliminate uh, developmental delays and deviance. Earlier placement leads to better outcomes. Quality of foster care matters. And on that note, I'll stop. Thank you. Steve. I want to go back now to the ethical question, if okay. I could. It seems to me that if there had been in another nation kind of local norm of the institutional care was preferred, this would have been a very different study ethically to do. Absolutely. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so in a country that doesn't institutionalize its kids, then you couldn't possibly do a study like this. But the, the trick is, what country is that? So many people think the United States is such a country. So about four years ago, the Department of Justice asked me to work with them on a federal lawsuit they were bringing against the state of Florida uh, because Florida had hundreds of kids living in state-run institutions. And it turns out these are, many of them are in uh, child protection cases, not, although not all. And the state had had disincentives for families to keep their kids and incentives for businesses to crop up and warehouse these kids. Now many, many were medically uh, fragile, but still, there are, and residential care, some would argue, is institutions. But still, if the country did not have a history of institutionalized kids and think that's the best solution, ethically, we could not have done this. Yeah. Um, that was a really interesting talk. Really appreciate Thank you. Really speaking to us. Um, you may not know the answer to this question, but um, you know, you showed a lot of differences um, in terms of making birth biological consequences of having been institutionalized. We know they're all consequent. Um, the risk of behavioral and psychological problems decreases with maternal age. And I'm wondering whether or not you check to see if there's a difference between the age of the parents of the institutionalized group and the age of the parents who are never institutionalized control kids. I'm embarrassed to say no. And I'll, and I'll go one further. That I can look at. But one, many years ago, a reviewer said in one of our papers, now, it's great you did random assignment to prosecutor, but you didn't do random assignment to the institution, which, of course, you couldn't do. But the point was well taken. We don't know which kids wind up being abandoned and which do not. So some of the fact that, that some of the, our observations that the kids in foster care get better, but they don't look as good as they never institutionalized, could be timing. Maybe we didn't place them young enough. It could be also a break of some sort that's preventing them from getting older. And there could be any number of prenatal variables that operate like that over and above parental age, which I can, I can look at. Sort of related to that question, I'm curious about the very early one. I mean, does the mother not take them home from the hospital? Oh. Do they so nurse? The standard is mom delivers in the maternity hospital usually goes home in a week or something. She goes home, baby stays there. Um, and then the baby stays in the maternity hospital for a month or two, which is like an institution, until they're put in a formal institution. There are, we have some moms who took their kids home, but a month later they put in the institution. So the vast majority were abandoned very close in the first months of life. Is that? Yes, and I'm just wondering if there's the possibility of it being a shorter, earlier period. Yeah. And the thing is, we don't have the sample size to address that. It's a great question. Because we're going to have like two of these and two of these, and it wouldn't be enough to address that, which is too bad. Um, I'm sorry you mentioned this. I didn't hear it. Did you assess the attempted state of mind of the caregivers? No. 
uh, you know, we didn't, the sort of attachment in it was a got later, but we didn't really ever look at the caregiver's conception of these relationships, which is another thing that we probably should have looked at. But it's a good, so it's a good point. Um, did you assess the stress level of the caregivers? Or, or no, so the focus was on the kids. And in early days, and we, with the study, we could not have got permission to do anything with the caregivers. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you very much. I was wondering, as you follow these uh, children through um, adolescence and you know, day of 16, do you find a difference in the instance of depression rates as they go through adolescence? What did they just So far, we have not. Nor have we seen any gender difference. But we're just, having said that, we're only now looking at the 16 year psychopathology data. So that was true at 12. But who knows? I don't know what will happen at 16. So that's a good point. Yeah, I guess the other thing that I'm struggling with a little bit is the, the, the two contrasting groups are kind of institutionalization as normal, which is not just institutionalization, but also like a really poorly funded, poorly staffed kind of setting versus um, high quality foster care. And just thinking about you know, from, a, from a policy standpoint, if governments are going to look at this and say, I have this much money, it's been here or here, you know, are we really looking at two equivalent groups? Are they going to say, oh, we'll throw them all in foster care, but they're actually not going to be quote unquote high quality foster care? And we don't really know if foster care is what's better or if it's just a better funded, better staff, or, or better like. All good points. You know, so the, we put a wedge between the two, and by drawing a big difference, it's possible that it's not very realistic what will happen. In the study that we hope to start in Brazil, we'll, we'll probably do enhanced institutional care compared to regular institutional care compared to foster care as a way to address that. Um, do you have any sort of qualitative data that you can use to say that you take it from the foster, from either environment looking just sort of at a more global assessment of how things are going or sort of, I know you have some measures of, of like caregiver report, yeah. but I'm kind of curious about whether all the data are, are these sort of scale measures and physiologic uh, uh, tools or whether you have actual, yeah, I mean, I just sort of more qualitative assessments. No, we have no qualitative data. We're, uh, in my talk tomorrow, I want to talk about a project we're doing in Bangladesh, then we have done qualitative work, but not here, unfortunately. Yeah, no, we, we can't get school records and we can't get health records, which is unfortunate. Um, Daniela Coffer at Berkeley has yeah. got a, a, a rodent model of sort of neglect, and she showed that um, neglect uh, redirects the developmental trajectory of stem cells to differentiate into oligodendrocytes instead of neurons, Right, which might explain the, you know, the gray matter, white matter findings. And my question is, is she found a sex effect? I think it was a finding she did. Pr pr uh, primarily in males. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you saw a sex no, effect. No, we, we, we're not. But, you know, I don't think, she and I have talked about this, we don't have sensitive enough tools, I think, to pick up that sex effect. It could be with a sensitive aspect, you might see it in the brain, but it might not see it in behavior, but we don't see it in behavior, which is too bad. In some other work that the Cal Hench and Pat Levitt are doing with mice, same thing, they see gender differences in this fragmented care model, but we don't see it in kids. Reflecting on that thought, given the way they were raised, there doesn't seem to be a lot of gendered toys, gendered modeling, gendered anything, and so that might be a big component. Sure, of the that's reasonable. Settings, as yeah. Opposed to it being yeah. A it could be you, you know because the kids really are raised in a way that's gender neutral. Right. So you know, we don't have the pushes and pulls to direct them one way or the other. So like yeah, that's true. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes, but I can't tell you what they are. But we have a paper that just came out in the last few months I could send you on competence. What are the protective factors in a family, regardless if it's in an institution or not? Uh, so if you follow up, I can send you that paper. Yeah. So do you know if um, your data have been used for policy? Yes. So, yes. 
Uh, the WHO and UNICEF uses this work as its strongest evidence to convince governments to stop putting kids in institutions. They've had varying success in that, um, but both of those agencies do this. And we know other countries, um, like Uganda, have uh, heard the message and have changed their system. And many other countries have heard, have, have moved to stop putting kids in institutions. I had a call yesterday with a guy who's former director of USAID, and it turns out El Salvador uh, is now going through the same thing. But other countries have said, oh, those are remaining kids. What does that have to do with South Africa or something like that? And so we've had, there's been mixed success. But it's an example of how science can lead to policy changes. Total cortical volume is reduced. Why, we don't know. Is it a loss of synapses, a loss of cell bodies, a loss of dendrites? You know, we're not sure, and we'll never know because we just don't have the resolution to do that. Reduced. My guess is on all of the sample size would be low. For kids who had criteria for ADHD in this sample, exemplifying the developmental psychotherapy kind of probably look different from non-deprived kids who get ADHD. Do you have enough resolution in the brain images to, to no. test that hypothesis? You know, that and autism are the two places we wanted to go. I don't think, like in autism, 5% of our kids have autism. I don't think for a moment it's the autism I study in Boston. And the question is, is this the same ADHD that you would study here? And I, we don't know if we have enough imaging data on those kids to answer that question. Just a really quick follow-up question about the total brain volume. I, I, I don't know if I'm making this up, but I think I remember seeing the, the head size is smaller in this cohort, too. Or maybe I'm... I can't... I think that's right. I think in our EEG papers we have to report head circumference, and I think it is smaller. They're not microcephalic, but they're, they're smaller. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Oh.